now here. So um, Matt Taibbi, who uh, is still, I guess, trying to publicize his Twitter files report, which was a glorified public relations piece done on behalf of one of the richest men on planet Earth, because that man, Elon Musk, was getting a lot of bad public relations because Twitter blew, the rollout was a failure, <laughs> caused advertisers to flee the platform. Um, a lot of other bad press about the chaos in his acquisition of Twitter. And then what do you know? Matt Taibbi, Barry Weiss, and openly working with this incredibly wealthy man um, under the guise of challenging the powerful came out with the, the the Twitter files revelations, which there really was not much there there. What was discovered was that Twitter got a message, a few messages from the Biden campaign asking them to take down tweets that linked to nudes of Hunter Biden, yeah. and they obliged. The scandal is um, in making moderation decisions that there's some political consideration uh, in addition to like just strictly looking at the uh, rules, which has been reported, for instance, at Facebook, uh, uh, like the instance I'm talking about when they got rid of, uh, or when they were talking about Trump and the, when the looting starts, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. But what Tybee's doing is people can uh, go on Wikipedia, search limited hangout. A limited hangout or a partial hangout is a tactic used in media relations, perception management, politics, and information management. Uh, 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 basically, uh, the idea is, uh, I'm just going to read this because um, I think this is important for people to know. According to for, uh, former special assistant to the deputy director of the CIA, Victor Marchetti, a limited hangout is spy jargon for a favorite and frequently used gimmick of the clandestine professionals. When their veil of secrecy is shredded, they can no longer rely on a phony cover story to misinform the public. They resort to admitting, sometimes even volunteering, some of the truth while still managing to withhold the key and damaging facts in this case. Now, I would say that's exactly what Tybee's doing, um, trying to basically release this as if it's um, a partisan anti-Democrat thing, mm -hmm. like the only people that are being uh, censored or whatever, or de-boosted um, uh, de are uh, Republicans, which is absolutely silly. We know leftist accounts get... Uh, um, uh, uh, Demonet, um, uh, uh, banned deprioritized. and deprioritized and deboosted yeah. all the time. Um, and we, uh, and I also, like somebody pointed out, what is, uh, like you, if I had access to all of uh, Twitter's documents, I'd probably look at like, say, what is Saudi Arabia doing here? Yeah. Like those sorts of cases. And we've heard nothing of that. It's all been the wokes. But there is a self-consciousness on Taibbi's part that he even cannot conceal in that he has to cover his ass to a certain yes. degree and say that the Trump White House has been in communication with Twitter as well. And then move on. And then quickly. move on. No, but like, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in that because the actual administration that was in power. Yeah, I, the one that was actually in the White House as opposed to a campaign. There would be more there there if the Biden camp Biden administration now uh, was doing this. But uh, even then, I, the story is while political elites have access to Twitter and they have access to channels that the regular people do not. And the conceit is that, well, uh, it's liberals who have more of an access, and yet he he claims and says, well, there was uh, a there were communications between the Trump White House and Twitter uh, imp uh, people at, at Twitter as well removed. about having stuff that removed doesn't reveal that, and yet claims that just because there are, are by his just uh, assessment, there's more political alignment from Twitter employees with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, that that means that there is a suppression of Republican voices on Twitter. He doesn't offer proof of that, except for the limited hangout that Matt describes, while still having to, to concede that he's not giving all the information while calling it transparency. So, all of that is really a prelude to say, this is why Matt Taibbi has been in the news recently. The, the truth teller who wants to speak truth to power while working with a billionaire. One of the big- A PayPal billionaire. Yeah, a PayPal billionaire. One of, so, and not just a billionaire. One of the 
top billionaires in the world. So once again, if not the richest person on the planet. And it's no surprise to see Greenwald in there because once again, we have a trove of documents being released. This time even less. I mean, there's no act of heroism as far as I can tell uh, um, from like Edward Snowden or, or Chelsea Manning. It's just a guy bought it and said, yeah. here, this is what I want to give you. And, and, and I want and you to release it in my fa- my, the way on I my fit. platform. And I'm also going to uh, delay the release of the sequels because I am go- need to, to parse through it and determine what can be released and what cannot be. And just to comment on those conditions, I guess Taibi released a, uh, a a paywalled uh, explainer about like explaining some of those conditions that were and I, he's landed on he wanted me to uh, publish it on Twitter and I'll just say I don't believe Matt Taibbi I think Taibbi's a liar and I don't think that's the uh, extent of the conditions because I think if that was the extent of the conditions you could just say that right away uh, it's going to be on uh, Twitter instead of Substack because this is the guy who bought it mm-hmm. you could just say that instead of being opaque about it so I mean, maybe I'm wrong maybe that's all it is but I think uh, as, as for right now my, I reserve the right to call that um, a probable lie I, I think that that is entirely fair. And um, there's been an effort really by people online in the wake of the a kind of wet fart of, rep- of, a, of reporting that uh, this, this actually was to maintain the myth that Matt Taibbi is a liberal journalist or a progressive journalist who really has just gotten fed up um, and that Barry Weiss is as well. We know this to be false. Uh, a lot of their cachet in the media space is reliant on that myth. It is financially beneficial for them, for people to keep calling them that and saying that anybody who is claiming otherwise is just a radical and they don't really know what true the true politics really are of of uh of Matt Taibbi and his ilk how about you take a listen to him here on the Ben Shapiro show and make a determination for yourself here he is uh speaking to the Daily Wire to Ben Shapiro talking about why conservatism is appealing to younger people the numbers would say that's not the case um but here he is uh and you can judge for yourself if the assessment of him as uh, just a disaffected liberal is an accurate He's one. He's a reactionary liberal. Well. That's what I call him, but we can get into that. Okay. If I was growing up, there would have been no thought at all of conservatism as an attractive ideology for a young person. Like, that, that, that was completely out of the realm of possibility. But now, I think you see it very significantly with something like humor. There's just no sense of humor on on the political left now. And that used to be the exclusive province um, of the political left once upon a time. I mean, I, I grew up listening to Richard Pryor albums and, you know, that Sam Kinison. That was my education growing up. And uh, hmm. those were our people, we thought. Uh, and now all of a sudden uh, there's no joking allowed on the side of the aisle. And that's one of the things that's funny, uh, incidentally, about uh, Matt Walsh's movie is that it's done with a kind of sense of humor and a satirical bent that's sort of taboo uh, on our side of the aisle now, which I find really strange because that that shift happened almost overnight uh, and imperceptibly. I had done an interview with a woman <laughs> named Kara Dansky, who is a so imperceptible that it almost might not exist. <laughs> this is I, this is such bullshit. I'm so sorry, but like. Even beyond beyond the now you can't say anything anymore part of it. Yeah. Name name one conservative who's funny. Not the guy he's talking to right now. Name and I, and I mean in this ilk. I'm not saying for example like I'm like I like Andrew. Oh, no, Matt Walsh. Andrew I mean, clearly the first person that comes to mind for comedy these days is like, Matt Walsh and his hate documentary. Mm-hmm. Like Andrew Dice Clay, for example, like is probably a conservative comedian. Like I, but I'm talking about guys that like if he's saying if he's if his com- comedic touch point here is Matt Walsh's movie about going to africa to find one tr- one african tribe that doesn't that only acknowledges the gender binary that's not fucking funny trump Sorry. trump is funny by accident and like I, I mean and just by his mannerisms i i believe but that is not and you could make an argument that as a political candidate it's a benefit to be a little bit more off the cuff like trump and making jokes and stuff like that but these are very shallow waters that we're wading into and what what taibi is saying there is it, it's just a conservative trope that you can't say anything anymore and that's why people are leaving the left and there's nothing original about that thought i've heard it hundreds of times on conservative radio for like tv <laughs> for for decades 
<laughs> the other thing, the other thing is like we were talking about this before, and like one of Elon Musk's radicalizing moments to want to buy Twitter is that the Babylon Bee was taken off Twitter. And let's be clear. The, it, the issue with the Babylon B is not that it's cutting edge, is not that it's it's biting, is not that it's too, it's too controversial to be on Twitter or anything like that. The issue with it is that it's not funny and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. That's the issue with it. Right. Um, but do we have more? I mean, he has this shit yeah, about Kara Dansky. Is this worth it? Like, yeah, let's watch. Okay. It's, it's just different the aisle now which i find really strange because that that shift happened almost overnight uh, and imperceptibly sorry done I, I just have to stop it there like this shift happened uh when taibi failed to stand up to the cancellation that he uh, um i think like was unfair i don't think there was never any accusations about him um, um being sort of abusive to workers or whatever i think it was all sort of a like self-reporting from what i think is described as gonzo journalism even if it's in the nonfiction section i mean this is a long there's a long line of this stuff being fictionalized um but like taibi had a chance to address this stuff number of times i was working for him as a producer on Tarfu Tarfu report at the time and numerous times we said hey a lot of people are saying stuff that is uh, uh pretty troubling about a book you wrote uh you should address that and every time we told taibi to do that he looked scared and it was and it's very different um in terms of i'd compare it to uh, sam with the um uh, roman polanski thing when that stuff came out sam was ready to address it in that moment because he didn't have anything to be afraid of um Taibi, he looked distant and he pushed it off and that was the moment he should have actually done it instead he threw uh, his writing partner mark ames under the bus and tried to save himself um, and hmm. I would recommend Radio War Nerds uh, episode about this uh, if you want uh, more backstory there. But like, y we can play a little bit more of this clip. But this idea that it happened overnight, like, nah, you made a, a decision after um, basically missing your moment of courage. And to hear him talk about, oh, now I have the courage to talk about this woke mind virus and how it's making people like too accepting of trans people who we need to like have a intramural conversation about. It's it's just it's venal. It's about money, and it's because uh, like Taibi, like and it, like there's this thing about like they missed the golden era of objective journalism. They would never for, um, admit <laughs> that, but like they they Taibi wishes he had the career that his dad did, which is being at the major um, networks and having a mainstream media career. And he's upset that he's not allowed to have that. In my opinion. Well, I and and frankly, if we're we began the conversation with Glenn Greenwald and you can, they are twins to a certain degree in like, in the fact that they are driven by personal resentment towards mainstream media sources and funded by PayPal billionaires. And, and funded by PayPal billionaires. Uh, Taibi is just better at keeping his cards closer to the vest and becoming a, a, a tad less histrionic. Although I do think that we can maybe debate that distinction between disaffected liberal and reactionary liberal i mean well that's it i, mean, I honestly i concede your i concede it, your it's point. the same thing it, i mean it's, it's same, yeah. yeah like yeah. it's just um like it is liberal to say uh, liberal as opposed to leftist to say like oh this boss should get to determine uh what speech comes out of this uh company and f the workers right like that's yeah. a liberal as opposed to leftist thing that's where that's where taibi and greenwald they are liberals um and in the truest sense in the true extent and that's why like liberal isn't just a thing in the democratic party and that's why we critique the limits of liberalism right. here on this program and so uh but but it's and you can see how that can become so easily guided towards the direction that someone like a ben shapiro wants let's yeah. just have him finish this well, it's, it's th like this the green it's like the dave rubin uh classical liberal thing. yeah Interview with a woman named Kara Dansky, who is a, a feminist, a, gen, a gender critical feminist. And uh, I, it's not that I purposely shelved it, I just didn't want to deal with the blowback that I knew was going to come. Mm -hmm. I, I kept telling myself it wasn't the right time. So yeah. uh, I, I felt guiltier and guiltier about that as time progressed. And when Matt's movie came out, when One as a Woman came out, I realized um, I thought this was an opportunity to kind of fix the that problem of having you know not run that interview so I, yeah. I did both at once i reviewed matt's movie and ran that interview at the same time and the the response was unbelievable J just for reviewing the movie forget about what i said about it stop um, it sorry I, 
it's how you reviewed it, you dumbass. Yeah, no, no, no. Forget, forget what I said about it. Forget my words. You bent over backwards to like launder it to basically uh, s Matt Walsh's D, and there was hmm. like, I mean, pathetic. It was pathetic that like, and like, oh, I just reviewed it. Like, uh, Nathan Robinson reviewed it. Like you did laundry for it, just like uh, you're Alex doing Jones. for Elon Musk, and, just like he's doing for Elon Musk, and just like uh, Greenwald did for Alex Jones. It's amazing to it's amazing to in one breath say you know uh, the, j- good objective journalism has passed us by, and my brand of truth telling is no longer acceptable in mainstream discourses, and then you in mainstream discourse, I should say, and then at the same time, like citing. Well, we just cited that there. His review of this film, which was essentially a promotion of it, and his Twitter files expose of Twitter, which worked hand in hand with a billionaire, and he published select cherry picked items from that trove on behalf of moneyed interests and then claiming it's journalism. Yeah, and let's just talk about Matt Taibbi's avoidance anxiety for a little bit. This whole thing about, yeah, I actually wrote this thing months ago. And it, he's a coward. He's admitting he's a coward. Yeah. He's admitting cowardice there. And I would just describe his cowardice differently. I think he had a chance to, say, address the things that was said about the Ames book. And he threw somebody else about the bu- uh, under the bus. He threw Mark Ames under the, under the bus. Um, Mark Ames is whose like, entire shtick, again, uh, listen to the Radio Warner thing, um, Tybee Stoll, the uh, the Gonzo journalist, uh, I'm doing this stuff. Everyone familiar with that says that was actually Mark Ames's bit. And once they got back to the state, all of a sudden Tybee started doing Ames's bit, and he got a Rolling Stone gig for it. Keep going. Um, yeah. Matt's movie and ran that interview at the same time, and the the response was unbelievable. J- just for reviewing the movie, forget about what I said about it. That's um, the important part. Uh, you know, I lost yeah. friends over that. There were there were people who who I've known for decades who who have now have basically said that I'm a transphobe and I I. Yes. I'm, that's it? All yeah. right. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's why you want us to forget what you said. I mean, not that this audience would have any disagreement, but because the the what what he essentially gave to the documentary in that view was inherently transphobic. And I would never say, uh, like, I, I don't really care what's in Tybee's heart. Maybe Tybee's just performing transphobia, um, but it's transphobia. Like, this whole thing where we need to take a look at, like, what really is a woman anyway? Um, and nobody will uh, really answer this. Um, we're in a documentary where Matt Walsh literally says, like, I'm just asking questions when he's asked, like, hey, what's the definition of a woman? Yeah. I mean, it, it, this is this is silly. Um, and, 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 and also, you can see how his comments about the, the left not being accepting of comedy anymore tie into his general resentment about, like, Me Too and the fact that he hadn't necessarily taken that on. I agree that there was unfair uh, conclusion jumping when it came to Matt Taibbi. He did leave that vacuum open, as Matt describes. He didn't address it. But, like, I mean, that he he wants to categorize his writings that spark that as comedy, and that's fine. He can he can make that case. But he's not really strong enough to make that case. So he just has the resentment that was birthed from that instance drive his political uh, it seemingly drive what he has to say about what the left uh the dynamics on the left are writ large without actually taking it head on yeah and uh there's a, there's a couple of things i want first let's just go back a little bit in time um to this thing where he says he, he lost a lot of uh of friends and, you know, we should all play a violin. It's really sad that uh, Taibi lost friends over that. Mm. He also made some friends. And, you know, easy come, easy go. Uh, uh, if you'll pull that... Uh, Plenty you, of fascist fish in the sea. You look at, like, there were some people who were actually encouraged uh, to see the, uh, the, the, the shift Taibi made. And we'll just put that up uh, uh, here. Um, Taibi t- uh, tweets, I-, I wonder if we're institutionalizing stereotypes about gender in the same way academics have tried to institutionalize stereotypes about how uh, hard work, being polite, punctuality, and the written word are white culture. And scroll <laughs> down, Elon, uh, just a regular follower of uh, Matt Taibbi's feed, says, we are, 
We are simultaneously being told that gender differences do not exist so that genders are so profoundly different that irreversible surgery is the only option. Perhaps someone wiser than me can explain this dichotomy. That had uh, 16,000 retweets, 117,000 likes. So I'm sure Matt Taibbi probably noticed that reply uh, from the richest man in the world. Um, and uh, he didn't reply to it. Imagine Elon Musk uh, replying to you and you don't say, hey, Elon, does all this woke stuff feel like the end of apartheid? Um, but Matt has a business relationship to uh, uh, maintain with Elon, so he's never he's not going to criticize this guy at all. And, and I would have never admitted that he would basically be his sort of like assistant um, PR person. Um, but I think the writing's been on the wall uh, for this in a while. And I would also just say, I, ha I haven't worked for Taibi. Um, he was a good uh, him and Perrine, both good boss for me. I got paid very well uh, to that. The only problem I have is like his inability to deal with the, the whole cancellation thing. Um, uh, but I also want to say like there were things, there were signs that this is true and put up this tweet uh, thread from a long time ago. Because I think people like, it's the same thing with Greenwald. Like these guys, may, I think, portrayed themselves as more radical and uh and uh uh sort of maybe even anti-capitalist um because that was where the the way the wind was blowing up because of sincerity so this is old old um thread from 2013 but where somebody's taking taibi to task uh, tweets at Taibi, but as dreadful as it is, it's entertaining that you don't realize that only left-wing stooges take you seriously he was uh, writing about wall street Taibi says, just out of curiosity, what's your definition of left wing? And the guy says, uh, one whose situation, uh, solution to every societal problem is to increase the scope of government and decrease someone else's liberty. Taibi responds, my whole argument against modern Wall Street has been that it's anti-capitalist perverted by incestuous ties to the state. Mm -mm. And Bradley, go to the next one. Uh, he also says, uh, somebody, there's a quote tweet in 2016 of somebody saying, corruption within capitalism causes people to foolishly think that socialism and communism works better. And Tybee says, I don't know many people who would describe what's going on with these too big to fail banks since 2008 is capitalism. So I think Tybee's just like a, basically an anti-communist. Well, you can, I mean, hey, uh, we'll, we'll call that as capital, we'll call that capitalism. We'll call that unfettered capitalism, what happened in 2008. Uh, but like the, there are certain things that get prioritized and certain things that don't when you're trying to uh, create mass appeal with your journalism at the time yeah. and some things that people like us might ignore because of the the value that it's providing at any current moment and we did the same thing with Greenwald uh, with his uh, with the Snowden reporting and uh, even with his reporting on Operation Car Wash so yeah we gave him the benefit of the doubt and these things these are all things that we knew about like same thing with Glenn being like um, you know uh, <laughs> doing uh, 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 enthusiastic work for uh, legal work for on behalf of Nazis mm -hmm. um, uh, like that stuff you, you, it's like I mean there's there's good people who have bad things like that in their past and if, as long as they continue to do good work I think you make allowance for it yeah and then it changes and then like so yeah like but I, then I, they say then they say that we're excommunicating them because it's a totalitarian left when in fact it, the proof is in the past where we, we were letting that kind of stuff slide. slide even if we had disagreements and you say everyone can evolve i've evolved yeah. i've evolved like I, I i totally agree but now your work is not what we agree with i disagree yeah. it's bad work and, and that's so it. that's what we say and i i um waited along there's a number of times uh, i could have dived in to criticize taibi um uh, not a week after brett weinstein tried to uh, get me fired from this job saying i was a drunk pilot taibi went on his show to basically talk about the same bullshit um and i don't think taibi knew because taibi even though i worked for him he didn't follow me um uh he didn't follow me until mm. it was time to uh fight about it, uh, stuff in the dms um uh, a year or so ago um but like i, I don't know i just think like Re listen to the Radio War Nerd episode. I think those guys uh, basically got done. And uh, this is sad, and, but it is what it is. And there's no denying uh, what it is now.